Good morning, church. Good morning. It's been a great place to be already. Just being on the platform, you see different things. And it, it looked like a church that like wanted to dance. It, it's like it's you're just like right on the edge, you know, but you're like, well, there's somebody next to me. And you might just need to ask your neighbor if they want to dance too. It's kind of my recommendation if you're feeling a little nervous because I get to see people like they're wanting to move, but they're like, I don't know about this, you know, and you're just right on the edge. And the title of today's message, by the way, being on the edge is pressing on, pressing on past where we are. There was an older lady went grocery shopping and she went in and got her groceries. When she came back out, she realized she'd locked her keys in the car. And she found somebody, gave her an old coat hanger, and she's trying to get the thing unlocked, and she's down there trying to get the latch, and a guy pulls up next to her on a motorcycle, and she'd been praying, God, I don't know how to do this. Send somebody to help. And the fellow gets off the motorcycle, and he's covered in tattoos and wearing black leather, you know, a skull cap. And he says... Let me help. And in about 15 seconds, the car is unlocked. And, and she's just so excited. And she, she gives him a great big hug. And, and she says, you're just such a nice man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And he goes, ma'am, I'm, I'm not a nice man. In fact, I just got out of prison for auto theft. And, and she said, <laughs> praise the Lord, he sent me a professional. <laughs> How do we act and react when we face discouragement? And we're in tough or stressful situations. Or maybe you're in your life right now and you're facing some difficulties. Is anybody facing any stressful situations in their life right now? Maybe even God has closed some doors in your life. See, we believe God opens doors, but you know the other's true as well. Sometimes He closes doors because He's got a bigger and better door in store for you and me. Huh? And some of us, maybe we haven't felt like we've been living up to our standards and, and maybe we're in just this season where we're trying not to panic, we're trying not to get stressed out. And God just wants to say to His church this morning, if you've been hitting a brick wall, if you've been stressed God's saying, I'm not finished with you yet. I'm not finished. Philippians 1.6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. All his promises are yes and amen. Can I get an Amen then He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Can I get an amen? amen? See, Jesus is not just the author of our faith. He's the author and the finisher, isn't He, church? And see, the thing we don't realize sometimes is that good things take time. Now, when I sow to the flesh, I get immediate gratification and then the sorrow that follows thereafter. But when I sow to the Spirit... It takes a while. But in the end, I'm glad I did. Is anybody hearing me this morning? Walking with God, sowing to the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, it takes a while. And often we can get discouraged and feel like giving up. We feel like doors aren't opening. We feel like every door is slamming in our face. And listen, the enemy will fight you harder and harder the closer you get to your breakthrough. If you are hitting brick walls, there's a reason. It's because the devil is scared. If you feel like hell is being unleashed in your life, praise the Lord, because it means you're close to the end of this trial. And the enemy is getting intense because he knows he's losing. He knows he's already been defeated. Are you facing resistance? Anybody hitting resistance this morning? God is saying to His church, it's time to press on. It's time to keep pushing forward. And listen, the Scripture says that the path of life, it winds upward for the wise. 
And so the first thing we need to press on, we need to press higher. Turn in your Bibles to one of my favorite passages, Philippians chapter 3. This is one of those passages that absolutely changed my life. It's one of my life passages. I come back to this and every time, it's like it's fresh all over again. It's like I hadn't read it before in some ways. Philippians 3.14, pressing higher. Paul says in verse 14, and I'm going to go back to verse 12 and 13, but in verse 14 he says, I press toward the goal for the prize of, notice this, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's an upward call. He's calling you to go higher, to press higher, church. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. Did you know that God has a call for your life? Turn to your neighbor and say, I have a mission from God. (laughs) Some of you are like, that feels funny saying that. It shouldn't, because it's true. You have a mission from God. You have a calling from God. It comes from Him. And He's calling you to go higher in Him. Philippians 3 verse 10 says that I may know Him. It doesn't say that I may know about Him. It's a personal relationship with your Creator. And the word know means to know through experience. It's not just reading about Him. It's getting to know Him by walking with Him and talking with Him and listening to the still small voice. Do I have a church here this morning? Does anybody here know Jesus? And in the the Scripture, it indicates that it's an ongoing thing. It's not that I just get to know Him and we're done. It's that I keep getting to know Him more and more. I keep going deeper and deeper and further and further into my relationship with Jesus Christ. He's calling us higher. And if you're facing stress, don't focus on the stress. Focus on your Savior. He says that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection. Why? Because resurrection power lives inside of you. If you are a believer this morning, the same power that raised Him from the grave is in you. But listen, we don't just get to know Him when things are easy. We oftentimes experience the power, listen, when we need the power. And that's in the valley. Because notice what He goes on to say. The power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. See, I can realize His power when I see in the valley that He's my strength, that He's my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Do I have a church this morning? He's your strength. Listen, I know in the hard times that I will be okay and I can go through anything because I've learned that He loves me. I know Him. And I know my Savior's good. He's good all the time. Even when the enemy brings trials, my God is still good. You are good. You are good. You are good all the time. Our God doesn't change just because our circumstances change. He remains good. He remains faithful. And His power is present in the valley and the trials. Philippians 1.21 says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This life is all about who, church? Jesus. If to die is gain, what is heaven all about? It's about a person, and His name is what, church? Jesus. Guess what? What we find from the Word of God is that everything, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Him. That I may know Him. He's calling us higher. He's calling us to just dive straight into Him. Oh, but you don't know what I'm going through. I'm saying to you, do you know who I'm talking about? Because He's bigger than whatever you're going through. He's bigger than what I'm going through. Quit exalting your problem and start exalting your Savior. He's a lot bigger. He's a lot more powerful. I'm preaching better than some of you are acting. Matthew 6.19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because it's a waste of time. 
Because that's where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. I can't keep or take any of it. But notice verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Spend your life and your time on what counts. You were created and formed by God with a purpose to make a difference. Did you hear that? You were formed with a purpose to make a difference here on this earth that goes clear into eternity. Oh no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a million dollars. That's fine. But I want to win a million souls. Do you know you have a purpose? I'm convinced that the church walks aimless, purposeless, and therefore powerless. And if we would just grasp that we have a Creator who has given us His purpose and a plan for our life, and if we would go after that with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, if we would go after Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, listen, the church has a power and a passion in it that the world does not have. It cannot compete with it. No local bar can give me what Jesus has put in me. Only Jesus can set me free. Only Jesus can give me passion. Only Jesus can take my fears and my sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west. There's no drug, there's no TV show that's ever been invented that could ever come close to what Jesus does in our life. I'm not going to waste my life on things that don't matter. I'm going to spend it all on Him because He gave it all for me. Does anybody here ever feel like in your life you're just being stretched, stretched, stretched? It's like, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to snap in two. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You left your comfort zone three weeks ago, three months ago, three years ago. You're saying, will this ever stop? And God's saying, no, because I love you. It won't. Because He doesn't want you to just press higher. He's teaching you to press harder. You haven't given, I haven't given God everything yet. There's things that I've still, I don't even realize it sometimes, but there's still ways I'm holding back, and you are too. Now Philippians 3.12. He says, not that I have already attained. See, Paul realized he still hadn't gone all the way yet. Or am already perfected. I haven't arrived, and I haven't reached my full potential yet. And neither have any of us. But notice this, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. He has instilled within you purpose and potential and power. He has laid it within you and He is saying press on until you fulfill the fullness of the call of God and the purpose and plan that He has on your life. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. Verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. I have been accused at times of being uh, kind of having a one track mind. My wife is giggling. (laughs) But according to the scripture, it's a compliment. Turn to your neighbor and say, You have a one track mind. Now turn to your neighbor and say, thank you for the compliment. The Apostle Paul had a one-track mind. He said, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and notice this, reaching forward. The, the phrase reaching forward in the Greek means to stretch. It comes from, from racing. It comes from the, the Olympics. And they would watch runners who thought they couldn't give any more, but they would, then they would. They thought, I'm going to break down, I cannot push any harder. But they would fight through the pain, they would press on, and they would find strength they didn't even know they had. Church, we haven't given it all yet. You've got more. You're stronger than you know, you're stronger than you thought. 
You have more in you than you realized. Your potential is more than what you've already achieved. Are you hearing me this morning, church? Reaching forward to those things which are ahead. See, we are, God is stretching us out. King David had the same mindset. Remember, the man after God's own heart. Psalm 27, verse 4, he said, One thing, one thing I have desired of the Lord, and that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in His temple. Is it alright if I preach the Bible this morning? I'm just reading Scripture. Listen, do you all know the story? Many of you know about Mary and Martha and Jesus came to visit their house. And Martha has a great servant's heart and she's working hard in the kitchen trying to get dinner ready. And Mary just has a hungry heart. And so she's at Jesus' feet just taking it all in. And Martha finally gets frustrated and she comes into Jesus and she says, Jesus... Tell her to come help me. This isn't fair. And Jesus looks up and He says, Martha, Martha, listen to what He said. You are troubled and worried about many things. How much are we to be focused on? How many of us, if we're honest this morning, have had our mind on many things? And notice what Jesus said about Martha. Martha. Verse 42, this is Jesus, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. There is something about getting all my attention on Jesus Christ. It's something about when He consumes my thoughts. His words consume my thoughts. You know what? I start to press harder then. Because all of my energy, all of my attention is going in one direction. What's happening in a lot of our lives is the world is stealing our energy. Through worry, through stress, through temptation. It's taking our energies away from God. It's weakening us from pressing. But God is saying, just get your eyes on the one thing that matters. Amen? And He won't let it be taken from you. I don't have time to have quiet times. Not according to Jesus. He says if you determine to put Him first, you have time. And if you don't have time, you're too busy. That'll preach right there, won't it? See, a lot of Christians have gone into what I would term early retirement. I've even seen just baby born again Christians just kind of like, Sit back on their rocking chair. You know, and have you ever seen Christians do this? Like, I've put in my time. Now, they still got 40 years of life left, but you know, they've put in their time. And they kind of just rock back and forth on the porch, waiting for heaven, polishing their halo. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, I know that's none of us here this morning. I do see some pretty clean halos out there this morning. Some of you have a really good church face. See, we're not done yet because God's not done with us yet. He's saying press higher. Press harder. And number three, press farther than you've ever been. Press farther than you've ever been. Let's go back to verse 12 again. He says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. Is anybody here this morning pressing on? You haven't stopped. Or have you went into early retirement? Hmm? Well, somebody hurt me, so I'm done. Join the club. Huh? Well, you don't know what those people did. You don't know what people did to me. But I tell you, who does know what happened to us? And He can heal us. And He can set us free from that pain so we can move on. See, this is what we're going to find that the Apostle Paul knew. And this is so powerful. He says, I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, notice what we need to do, forgetting. Yeah. 
those things which are where? Behind. Too much of the church nowadays is living in the past. Too much of the church has a history lesson about what God did. And they have nothing to say about what He's doing besides complaints. They have nothing to say about the church besides what's wrong instead of what's good. Listen, if we are still here and if there are problems, then God wants to use us to fix them. Amen. Amen. We forget the things which are behind and reaching where? Forward to the things which are ahead. So many Christians living in their mistakes, living in what happened 10, 20, 30 years ago, what happened last week, and God says, get over it, move on. It's time to move on. Listen, some of us get stuck in the good things we did. Well, you know what I did, and we talk about our triumphs, and you see Christians bragging about what happened, and God saying, I would have done so much more with you if you hadn't stopped there. Huh? We camp on our blessed assurance and wait for heaven when God is saying, no, I have so much more for you here and now. Listen, you will break the power of yesterday when you turn away from yesterday and focus on today. When you focus on the now. Someone this morning just needs their fire started again. It's like you're here and you're... I believe the Word of God is stirring you and you're, you're fresh and ready. You just need the spark. That's all you need. I, I just think this place is full of kindling this morning. And when that gets lit, you better get out of the way because it's going to be a wildfire. Did you hear that this morning? See, the church likes a little campfire, but our God is an all-consuming fire. He's not controllable. He's not something you can put in a box in a can and say, we just had revival, we just... No. He's bigger than us. And we'll just light the fire and watch it burn and let Him do what He wants to do. Amen? There's some of us this morning who have a thirst that only God can quench. You have a hunger that nothing in this world is going to satisfy. And God is just getting our attention back on the one thing that matters this morning. Psalm 42 verse 1 says, As the deer pants for the water brook, so, my, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When am I going to get to get back into His presence? I can't stand being away from His presence any longer. Anybody with me this morning that you just got to get in the presence of Almighty God? You know that only He's going to quench your thirst. Only He can satisfy. Nothing else will do. Listen, God is not finished with us yet, is He? The best is yet to come this morning, church. Listen. Psalm 92 says this, For behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered, but my horn, the word horn speaks of the strength that you have. My horn, my strength will be exalted. You have exalted like a wild ox. I love this phrase. I have been anointed with fresh, fresh oil from God. Somebody needs a fresh anointing this morning. You've gone dry. You've lost your flame. All you need is a fresh anointing. You haven't lost your calling. You haven't lost your purpose. You haven't lost God's plan for your life. Listen, you just need a fresh anointing. That's all you need this morning. Hallelujah. They went and gathered manna every morning because it must be fresh. You need a fresh word. You need a fresh anointing. And when you receive that, I promise you, your strength will be renewed. He says in verse 11, My eyes, my eye also has seen my desires on my enemies, my ears hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. You don't, but Pastor, you don't know what happened to me. Once again, God does, and He'll take care of it. 
It says in verse 12, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, and he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Do you remember that word fresh? It also could be translated as green and flourishing. It's like when a plant that was wilting. You ever seen a plant that's just wilting for lack of nourishment? And maybe it needs repotted in good soil. Or listen, maybe it just needed water. And you give that plant some water, maybe you repot it in good soil, and what happens to that wilted plant? All of a sudden, life comes back because its life source has returned. And I want you to see something here. When you receive an anointing, a fresh anointing from God, what it does is it restores you. And listen, the fresh anointing is for where He's taking you next. The anointing will prepare you and equip you for what you need. The church has downplayed the importance of the presence and the anointing of God. We've relied upon tricks and gimmicks and, and human strength when only God can do anything that's worthwhile. Without Him, I can do nothing. It takes the Holy Spirit, it takes the anointing, and nothing else will last. I want to sow things into the kingdom that go into eternity. It says in verse 13, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit when church in old age. We don't retire from the kingdom. They shall be what? Not just alive, thank you, but fresh and flourishing. Hallelujah. If you've been saved for a long time, God says, I have more for you than you've experienced yet. You haven't seen anything yet, God says. God is stirring up the church. He's stirring up those who have been saved, saying, I'm bringing babies into the house. And I need parents in the house. I'm bringing newborn children. And I need adult Christians who will grow up and raise up disciples for the kingdom. God is making us soul-winning disciples who will go and make soul-winning disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the vision of the church. That's the purpose of the church. That's where we are. Why are all these people coming in, Lord? So we can help them. Hallelujah. And some of them are here so they can help us, praise God, because I know I need it. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. Oh, that word flourishing, listen, is the same word that was translated as fresh anointing. The anointing is what makes you flourish. It's being connected to the presence. It's being focused on the one thing that I will do, that I may know Him. What happens in verse 15? Verse 15. What happens is we begin to declare that the Lord is upright, that He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in Him. We all can get caught up in things in our life aren't fair. Listen, we live in an unfair world, but we have a God who's completely righteous. And He will take every bit of unrighteousness and unfairness, and in due time, He will make it right. There is no unrighteousness in Him. If you are going through unfair circumstances, difficult circumstances, just give Him time. Good things take time. But I guarantee you this, if you will get planted in the house of God and you will get connected to the anointing of God, how many of y'all realize how better your week is this when you make it to church? You know what I'm talking about? Imagine if we stay connected seven days a week. Just getting plugged in on Sunday makes a world of difference. But what we are doing in this church is helping people get plugged in all through the week. How? Oh, Abraham, 75 years old, and God says, I'm going to give you a son. Your seed will be like the stars of the sky, the sand on the seashore. And listen, 25 years later, at the age of 100, Isaac is born. You say, it's too late. God's left me. No, He's just getting started. Yes, he is. Are you hearing me this yes, morning? There is no age group excluded, young or old. There is no mistakes that could kick you out if you want Him in your life. Are you hearing me this morning, church? Moses messed up big time. Killed an Egyptian. Had to run away. Spends 40 years on the backside of the desert thinking, God must be done with me. 
And at the age of 80, he's walking through the desert and sees a bush on fire that won't burn up. And God says to him, it's time to go back to Egypt. Tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Listen, Israel had been in captivity. They had been in, in Egypt for almost 400 years. Many of those years in slavery, they cried out to God and cried out to God. And all of a sudden, one day, Moses comes back. And he says, God is here to deliver you. Are you hearing me this morning, church? After all those years, He sets the captive free. Remember what Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And Israel walks out of Egypt. They walk up to the Red Sea. The enemy's behind them. Listen, you may be like, why are doors slamming shut in my life? Because God's saying, don't go back there. Egypt's over. Somebody needed to hear that. You were comfortable there. You knew everything there. But God has better in store. Amen? He'll slam the door behind you and then He'll part the sea in front of you and say, walk through on the path I made for you. Amen? God is making a way where there is no way. And He's slamming doors where He doesn't need us to begin with. Listen, they walked through the desert for 40 years because of rebellion. There's a man who began to walk young. By the end of the walk, he's getting a little older. Moses is going to die. But listen, this man who had been young, who's been faithful, his name is Joshua. And God says, Joshua, lead my people into the promised land. Walk across the Jordan. Guess how they crossed the Jordan? If you all remember this, the Jordan was in flood season. Most of the time, the Jordan looks about like a muddy creek. But at the, in the springtime of the year, it floods up its banks. And the banks of the Jordan are, I'm not exaggerating, almost as tall as the ceiling in here. And it was clear up to the top. And God says to the priest, take the Ark of the Covenant, take my presence, and step into the waters. Follow my presence and my anointing into the waters. And listen, those waters were raging, but the moment their feet touched the waters and they were willing to take that leap, that step of faith, they were willing to press on into places they had never been. They were willing to go higher and harder and farther than what they'd ever been before. The river stopped, backed up, and the people of God walked into their destiny. It is time for the people of God to quit wandering in the wilderness of their life. And it is time to fulfill the calling and the purpose and the plan that He has for you. God is saying to Cornerstone, your destiny is in front of you, not behind you. It's right here on the cusp. It's not time to turn back. It's not time to mourn. It's time to celebrate and press on in. I want to ask our worship team to come forward. Church, God is saying to us, just keep pressing on. Some of you have been dealing with severe sickness. God is saying, don't give up. Keep pressing on. Some of you have been dealing with deep discouragement or heartbreak. God is saying, don't give up. Don't drown in your sorrow. Get back up and go to me and I'll heal your heart. God is saying to some of us who have made mistakes, who have done things we shouldn't have done, and He's saying, I'm the Lord who forgives. I'm the Lord who restores. All right, is anybody hearing me this morning? If this message isn't for us, I don't know what one will be. If this one's still not for you, but for your neighbor, you'll never find a sermon that you're going to connect with. I'm connecting with this. This is life. His words are spirit in their life. Is anybody here this morning you hear God saying, just go a little higher? Press a little harder. And press a little further. Let Him stretch you to new places that you've never been. Let's stand this morning, church. I believe there's some Moseses in the house that are going to get restored. I believe there's some Joshuas. There's some generals in God's army that God's about ready to reinstate or instate for the first time. 
there's some moms in this house who've been discouraged. And God's saying, I have so much in store for you. I have a plan for your life. You've tried your plan. It didn't work. Those doors slammed shut. But God is opening doors for you that are so much better. I'm speaking to someone's heart this morning. God is here. He is real. Keep pressing on, church. These altars are open. Let's come and pray, church. Church, it's time to go to the altar that we may know Him. That we might receive that fresh anointing that will take us higher. That will help us to press harder and take us further than we ever thought possible.